Well, uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee uh, and, and Dr. Taylor for those very nice remarks, some of which are true, uh, some not. A uh, couple of things. I've known some of the people uh, on the organizing committee for a long time. Uh, Dr. Dasgupta, who taught me and got me interested in biofilm, and I think it's been an incredibly important subject. And uh, my comments about Dr. Fine, is he here? I didn't see him earlier. Is he not here? Well, that actually makes sense, okay, uh, what Dr. Taylor said. But anyway, Dr. Fine taught me a lot about salt and its importance. So uh, I have a lot of respect for the organizing committee and uh, thank them again for the invitation. The title of my talk was uh, uh, slightly negotiated. Uh, first of all, it was told to me, and then asked, I was asked, is that title okay? And I said, well, I can certainly talk about kinetics and I can talk about myths, but I didn't know how to put them together. So I sort of changed it a little bit. And so I thought we'd be talking about science and a little bit about magic, because there's an awful lot of both, unfortunately, rolling around. By the way, uh, my email address is there, and I would be glad to send the slides to anybody who requests them. So just email me. And, and then tomorrow, I'll show you my email again tomorrow. Uh, so the objectives is I want to start with uh, uh, urea versus the rest of the world, because that's part of the myth. of uh, I, I don't think urea is completely trivial, but I also don't think it's as important as a lot of people have implied earlier. And then, uh, as Dr. Taylor said, uh, looking at the flexibility of all the modalities within PD, and I'll, I'll just uh, predominantly focus on cyclers and automated PD, and there's a very specific reason which I'll get into in just a minute. And then uh, lastly, what, uh, the, by implication, what makes one modality work better than another? And I'm not sure that that is anything other than lifestyle, but I, want, I hope to be uh, able to leave you with uh, this, the flexibility and how that uh, uh, works around lifestyle. So let's start out with what is adequacy. And sh shown in this slide are four different opinions of adequacy. And it's like the blind men and the elephant. Everybody has their own view of it. Uh, but I'd like to offer an al alternative. So it, it's not easy to define. So I kind of like to make the analogy to beauty but there are an awful lot of people who make the analogy to pornography, okay? So you, you don't know how to describe it, but you know it when you see it. Now, yeah, I'm not, there's no test. You don't have to answer about the, the, the pornography side of that. But all of us would sort of agree that it does fall into these categories, the absence of uremic symptoms, increased well-being, normal nutrition and all of its consequences, normal volume homeostasis and all the consequences of that, such as normal blood pressure, and then rehabilitation to the best potential uh, for that individual. Here are the problems. We have confounding comorbid diseases, and I'll give you two examples. Let's take gastroparesis in a diabetic that is uh, causing uh, nausea, vomiting. Uh, is that a symptom of the gastroparesis or is that uremia? How about uh, heart failure? So intrinsic failure of the myocardium, uh, which could be from coronary artery disease, and yet that leads to edema and volume overload. Is that uremia? Is that adequate dialysis to uh, uh, improve that congestive heart failure uh, symptom complex? Next question then is, by the time you recognize that this is uremia, that this is inadequate dialysis, is it too late? Historically, the National Cooperative Dialysis Study that was published in the early 80s uh, randomized patients to less dialysis versus more, and those patients that were in the lower dialysis dose group had greater hospitalization, so much so that they had to terminate the study because of those bad outcomes. Okay, that's fine. That was the ethical thing to do. Let's stop the study because people are doing poorly. The trouble is that when they followed those patients over years after having gone back to a, a regular dialysis schedule or a more aggressive dialysis schedule, there was a, a worse outcome. So that outcome that was worse during the study carried over later. So by the time you recognize inadequate dialysis, could it be too late? 
It, it's a rhetorical question, but, but at least some evidence suggests that. And then this next comment on lab measures. Well, let's go into this. So a high creatinine, if it's due to uh, muscle mass, is a good thing. I've got patients with, and do you guys use milligrams per DL or are you using international units? I, I use, well, okay. So, uh, but in our u units, uh, I've got a, a few uh, PD patients that have creatinines 18 to 20. And they're, they're, they eat three meals a day and they're muscular. So in that sense, that, that high creatinine value could be considered good if it's due to large muscle mass. But as you all know, if it's due to uh, poor dialysis, then that's not good. Uh, and a high BUN reflects protein intake. I, I want my patients eating a lot of protein. They have a natural loss of protein, as you know, through their uh, uh, peritoneum. So uh, we encourage protein. So if they've got a BUN, again, that's high, and it's due to their uh, nutrition, that's, that's a good thing because they, have, they feel well enough to eat. On the other hand, if the BUN is high because of poor dialysis, then that's not good. So uh, these are all confounders in trying to define adequacy. So uh, the CANUSA study, which was uh, uh, published in the 90s, uh, reinforced the assumption that a small solute clearance, urea and creatinine were the two measures in the CANUSA study, that the outcome was better. And it led to this concept of increasing the dose of PD as measured by KT over V, or for that matter, the creatinine clearance. Now, I was the chair of the DOKI work group, and this was one of two studies that we had to, to direct us. And I can tell you, we spent hours. I, I, I was averaging probably 10 hours a week during this period of DOKI as we were analyzing what little data we had and, and, and listening to opinions. So uh, DOKI came out with some guidelines, and that's all they were ever intended to be as guidelines, not regulations. But what happened is industry picked up on those guidelines, and it was... Uh, this whole concept of uh, a dose by KT over V or urea just kind of exploded. And so in those guidelines, and as, as, as uh, Dr. Taylor said, I was the chair of this work group. The Canadians on that work group were uh, David Churchill and uh, Dennis Geary. Dennis is a, a pediatric nephrologist. Uh, uh, I, is he in Montreal or Toronto? I, anybody know Dennis? Anyway, sir, anyway further east. So, uh, but we stated in there that uh, small solutes weren't the whole ball game. Uh, everyone ignored that. So monkey see, monkey do, I guess, uh, on that one. So anyway, based on CANUSA and, and one other study, which I'm not gonna go into, these uh, uh, targets that were, are shown up here were thought to be relative. And, uh, so they were, they were in, meant to be targets. Well, they, they turned into targets, things you aim at, and when you aim, you know, you miss all around the target, but you aim at that. But these somehow got morphed into minimum values by regulatory bodies. And some of those regulatory bodies and, and their numbers are shown here. Um, uh, the Canadians fit right in there with the uh, rest of the world with sort of these numbers. But these were always intended to be guidelines from one healthcare provider to another healthcare provider, or perhaps to patients, but they were never intended by anybody to be rules or regulations. And so that led to what Joanne Bargman has called the urea-centric universe, and by that is uh, urea is the center of everything, and it dictates everything. And that is such nonsense, and that's one of the myths that I wish to uh, dispel. No one ever said that. That, that is all the non-healthcare provider thinking of urea being the center of the universe. So uh, Joanne then uh, did a reanalysis of the CANUSA study, and in that reanalysis, uh, she separated out the renal component from the peritoneal component. And the outcome was predicted by the renal component, the residual kidney function, not the peritoneal clearance. Well, now that makes it look like uh, the contribution of peritoneal dialysis doesn't impact survival. Well, that's the only way to do, to analyze that is to actually look at uh, the small solute clearance, and we'll use urea or creatinine, either one, 
but we'll do it in aneuric patients, so there won't be any contribution to residual kidney function. So uh, one study came out of this, is also Joanne's group, and this was, uh, it's a limited number, as you can see, 122 uh, patients, so that's not very many. The purpose of this study was to look at large patients. So in this study, the, the goal of the study was to look at can you achieve these targets in large patients? And the answer to that from the study was yes, you can. But an offshoot of that study was this last bulleted item that patients with a, a peritoneal creatinine, uh, K, well, a KT over V, of uh, greater than 1.85 actually did have a decrease in mortality. Now, it didn't achieve statistical significance, but those of you that know scientific literature realize that in 120 patients, that'd be a difficult thing to do anyway. But, but it certainly implied that in large Canadian patients, so these were patients in the general in uh, Ontario, uh, uh, large PD patients could do well uh, in an aneuric condition with peritoneal dialysis. So let's look at Chinese. Now we're gonna go from large Canadians to actually small Chinese patients. So this was a single center study. That you can see that the body weight is 59 kilos. Now in the United States, the, the uh, average body weight of a dialysis patient is 80 kilos. I don't know what it is in Canada, but I'll bet it's fairly close to, to what it is in the US. Anybody know what it is in Canada? All right, but in the US, unfortunately, it's 80, all right? Uh, uh, but anyway, as you can see, uh, I wanna, if you go to the last bulleted item, that there, uh, that there was a decrease in mortality risk the higher the KT over V. So remember now, this is all the contribution of peritoneal. These were aneuric Chinese. Again, suggesting that even though uh, residual kidney function is very, very important, it's not, it, it, in somebody who doesn't have residual kidney function, dose of dialysis may also be important as a survival advantage. So the same group then now four years later looked at all of their patients. And, and for, uh, no, let me, uh, for the sake of uh, just everybody understanding, incident patients are patients just beginning the therapy. Prevalent patients are patients that have been on the therapy. So when we talk about prevalent patients on peritoneal dialysis, they may not have residual kidney function. And we know that incident patients on PD, unless they're on PD for, uh, uh, because of a nephrectomy, have residual kidney function. So incident patients have residual kidney function, prevalent patients don't. Well, if you look to the bottom here where it's kind of in yellow, a little bit uh, uh, more yellow than white, the, the peritoneal contribution to survival was only significant in prevalent patients. So the prevalent patients were the ones, some of whom would not have residual kidney function. So uh, again, suggesting that in patients without residual kidney function, the dose of dialysis does matter. But for patients that have residual kidney function, the dose of dialysis is tiny as a contribution to survival relative to the contribution from the residual kidney function. So here's a cartoon of what I think is happening. So the, on the uh, vertical axis, probability of survival, on the, ho on the horizontal axis is dose of dialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And so uh, I've put arrows where, where we, that's actually been studied. And you can see that if the probability of survival is kind of tiny between those two uh, uh, arrows, that you might not be able to statistically prove a benefit from the dose of dialysis. But it doesn't mean that the dose of dialysis doesn't matter. Now, there, there were two randomized controlled trials looking at the dose of dialysis. Both trials had patients with residual kidney function, and that's okay because they adjusted for it. And what both studies did is they looked at the contribution to the total dose by the peritoneal difference. So they took into account the residual kidney function. And one of the things that we can derive from this, and I think these are fair, not very biased uh, generalizations, but I think they're fair uh, conclusions that we can draw from these two studies, which I view as a, a level of comfort, that you should strive for high targets. Strive for high targets, try. There may be relief in knowing that if you don't achieve those high targets, that if you listen to the patients and how they're doing, you'll be okay because they'll tell you if they're not well. And they'll do it because they aren't eating. 
or they might have uh, uh, now evidence of heart failure or high blood pressure from inadequate ultrafiltration. Their EPO requirements may be higher. So they'll tell you it's a matter of listening to them. And, and the other thing that these studies showed, and these were studies that lasted about two years, maybe a little bit longer in the Hong Kong study, but what they showed is that for those patients that weren't doing well, if you increase the dose, they did better. So there is, an, there, if you're paying attention to your patients, this concept of small solute clearance doesn't overwhelm your decision making. If they're not doing well, increase their dose of dialysis. So th th you have to balance it out because increasing the dose of dialysis has a burden. Uh, it, it, and you want to be able to increase the efficacy of the therapy without increasing its toxicity. If I go from four CAPD exchanges a day to six, I've just increased the risk of contamination by 50% of, of, of an episode of contamination of their system. So outcomes are always going to be a, uh, a balance between the benefits and the toxicity. Now from those two studies, I just want to list some of those. So uh, uh, in the lower dose group from these studies, there were more heart failure deaths, more deaths from uremia. Uh, there were increased dropout from the study for the same reasons. There was worse potassium balance in the lower dose groups. On the other hand, the higher dose groups who had an equal mortality rate died from something. So uh, the, the, the other causes other than uremia. There were more hernias and other symptoms of discomfort from TD in those people randomized to the high dose group. In fact, in both of those studies, there are subsets of patients who refuse to increase dose. I'm gonna talk about increasing dose in just a few minutes, but, but be aware that in these very uh, uh, regulated studies, patients refuse to increase dose. Why? Because it's a hassle. And to, to anybody who has to deal with the budget of your unit, you know that increasing the dose can be more expensive. So that's what I mean by the balance. So uh, where do we sit with PD with these concepts? Because I've tried to perhaps dispel the myth that uh, small solutes are the whole ballgame. So, but PD does a lot of things well, but small solute clearance just isn't one of them. In a few minutes, I'll talk about how you can increase small solute clearance, but I don't want to make that sound like it's the be-all and the end-all of the value of this therapy. So uh, if, uh, our PD patients have a higher BUN and creatinine levels than hemodialysis patients, and, and yet their uremia seems to have resolved. So why would we use small solute clearance like this KT over V as a measure of adequacy. And I know that in Canada, you aren't suffering from that as much as we are in the United States. And, and I think suffering was the right word. So let's go back to that same cartoon I showed earlier, and let's look at that area a little bit off to the right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Where I, I'm arguing that outcomes are mar more influenced by variables other than small solute clearance. And the small solute clearance for the, in the U.S., it's KT over V for urea, but it could be creatinine clearance a, as well. So something else is going on. So I think the urea-centric universe is the myth, and what I'd like to do is to move from the myth to the science, uh, uh, but taking the assumption that may, it, maybe there's something to the myth. Maybe we need to look at urea a little bit, and maybe we'll use KT over V as a measuring stick. So th that's how I'll use KT over V rather than buying into it, it's the sole measure of adequacy. Uh, I think I've discussed the other ways to look at adequacy. But we're going to use the KT over V urea for purposes of kinetics, and, and I want to talk to you about uh, Cycler PD. Why? Uh, Cycler PD in the United States represents 80% or more of all the PD patients. Now we're having some trouble in the United States a little bit, and I'll talk about that some tomorrow, but nonetheless, in the United States, it's 80%. Now I don't know what it is in Western Canada, but I know that in uh, uh, Central and in Eastern Canada, the cycler penetration is about 50%, which is what it is in Europe. What, what is it out here in the West? 80%. 80%. 
Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Is do you, any speculation as to why you are different than uh, your Eastern colleagues? Scott, you want to make a comment on that? All right. So in those two units, at, uh, well, in the West and in uh, Dr. Brimble's unit, which is in, you're just outside of Toronto or in Toronto? Yeah, outside, okay. Uh, so, but in Europe, it is not 80%. It's, uh, it's much less. Now, the, uh, the cyclers could be considered your ace in the hole if you want to deal with small solute clearance, and that's really where I want to go for the next few minutes. This is a really a nice paper, but I, I only want you to zone in on the bottom uh, part of this. So there's that long day dwell. In this particular paper, it's with eichlodextrin, which I would agree would be the right strategy here. But at the, at the bottom, you can see many, many cycles. That's at night, all right? And by doing that, comparing it to the upper picture that you see, so the upper picture has less cycles at night, but two exchanges during the day. And we're going to come back to that concept in just a minute. I'll be more specific in just a minute. But for the purposes of this study, which was done, there was a 9% increase in both creatinine and urea clearance with that uh, picture down below, with rapid cycles and many of them at night. But there's more to the story because those very same patients removed 48 milliequivalents less of sodium in a day with that regimen. They absorbed 30 grams more of glucose. There was no change in beta-2 microglobulin clearance, and that's important. Uh, that is a molecule of uh, about uh, 11 or 12,000 uh, Daltons, so it's, it's much bigger much bigger. It's 10 times bigger than, say, creatinine. Uh, but there was, so there's no change in the clearance of that larger molecule using either of these two regimens that you see here. And lastly, that regimen on the bottom had a 40% increase in cost. So, uh, so how do you maximally benefit the utilization of APD? Uh, it's interesting that, because I didn't realize that out here you have 80% penetration. Uh, so in a way, I could be preaching to the choir here, and I guess that's fine. But let's go through some of the kinetics uh, of this. And first and foremost is, is this triangle of why you would do something to any patient. You are going to make a, a prescriptive uh, recommendation to a patient based on these three things, predominantly. There are other things involved, but what is their lifestyle? I mean, what is compatible with the way they want to live their life and how their dial dialysis needs can get them adequately dialyzed? That's a rhetorical question. Of course, you have to control their volume and ultrafiltration. And what I've been talking about is solute. And the small, I'm going to stick with small solutes for a few minutes and, and talk about uh, things that we do in our thinking in automated uh, PD. So, when you start somebody on Cycler PD, per, now well, let me ask you this. Uh, so I'll, in Western Canada, do you start everybody on CAPD and then move to Cyclers, or do you, would you start some people empirically on Cyclers? Okay, did it, were everybody able to hear Dr. Taylor's answer to that? He said uh, many units start empirically on cyclers. Some, for a variety of reasons, might wait a month. So if the patient's lifestyle choice is to use a cycler, there, there may or may not be a, a, a slight delay. And if it's an incident patient, it doesn't matter. I think all of you know that when patients start with residual kidney function, which we'll talk about in just a minute, it, it's pretty hard to mess up their PD prescription when they have residual kidney function. Uh, I mean, you almost have to try to screw it up to screw it up. All right, so it, an empiric cycler prescription is going to be based on residual kidney function. Now, we do have anephric patients that present to PD. They've had a nephrectomy, for example, or they, they, their residual kidney function was part of their transplant, and the transplant was acting up, and it had to come out, so, or, or a kidney being removed for cancer. So there are reasons that you would go from residual kidney function to none instantly. You could do it based on an equilibration test, but we don't even do an equilibration test until, oh, 
uh, we're, we try to do it six weeks or so, but we, we sometimes we, it, it's four months before an equilibration test is done. So I will use an argument that if you did an equilibration test, what you might do for a, a prescription, but I recognize that many of us don't have the equilibration test results available. Then you could do it based on body size, and that whole concept is related to fill volume, and in fact, I'd like to spend a few moments on that in, in, in just a minute. So we've got our usual initiation, so it's non-urgent, and uh, this, so this is somebody who is likely to have some residual kidney function. So the types of decisions we have to make are gonna be how many hours on the cycler, what's the fill volume, how many cyclers are you gonna do, and what are you gonna do during the day? Are they gonna be dry or wet? And that, of course, will be based on the residual kidney function. So <clears throat> this is the residual kidney function in this patient now is greater than three which is reasonably substantial. Most of our patients, when they're starting PD, have residual kidney function perhaps twice or three times this. So, but we'll go to this lower amount and say uh, three milliliters, it says per hour, oh my goodness. I meant per minute, so that's a, a, a <laughs> sorry about that. That's a stupid mistake. All right. Anyway, uh, so what you, so, and I put them into categories here. So the low transporters would be off to the left and the high transporters to the right. R regardless of what their transport status is, they have residual kidney function. So you're pretty much going to be able to get by with anything you want, and, and most of the day can probably be dry simply because of that residual kidney function. So this is sort of a, a, a strategy to think through it. So let's go, the, the, it's going to be the same figure. Uh, and so now, another option is rather than dry during the day, maybe th just some nights off and completely days off. And what this is called is uh, incremental dialysis. So if you're adding dialysis to their loss of residual kidney function over time, we call that incremental dialysis. And there are an awful lot of people, and, and a lot of people, I see you nodding your heads, yeah, of course we do that. You'd be surprised, there are a lot of people who have no awareness of this concept of incremental dialysis. And they believe that you should be blasting people with full dose dialysis right from the onset. I have one of my associates that feels very strongly about that. So let's go now, I'm switching to residual kidney function that's less than three milliliters per minute. Sorry about that air on there, that should say, uh, for the title, it should say residual kidney function less than or equal to three milliliters per minute. And again, you can break it up looking at their transport status if you have the PET. But those people in the lower transport status category now without residual kidney function are going to need the day. So you, you're probably going to do less cycles at night. For one thing, they're slow transporters. So what's the purpose of doing rapid exchanges at night? They're, they're slow transporters. But you need to use the day. So those two groups to the left, low and lower average, are going to need some uh, uh, day activity. Now those to the right, because they transport small solutes rapidly, may get by with less uh, uh, daytime needs. Uh, but you're going to need more cycle needs. And that goes to that uh, cartoon I showed you earlier about glu uh, more glucose exposure, uh, uh, less sodium removal, and more cost, uh, with an improvement in small solute clearance without an improvement in larger molecular weight uh, removal. So the types of, <coughs> excuse me, so it, for cycler prescriptions, if to what to do during the day is going to depend on their, perhaps their equilibration test if you've done one, and certainly their residual kidney function. The number of cyclers are going to depend on their transport status and how much time they're going to spend on a cycler. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Time on the cycler is going to be determined by their transplant uh, uh, status and how many cycles you may want to perform. And the fill volume is going to be dependent on their body size. And I want to spend some time with that. So to me, the, the, uh, the priority of options for patients on a cycler would, would pretty much go in this order. So I would first increase fill volumes. Well, what are the consequences of that? Let's optimize fill volumes. 
There are recommendations. They're shown some here, uh, what those recommendations might be. Turns out those recommendations are pretty similar. I've done some of the math on it, uh, but those recommendations are pretty similar. And in fact, Baxter has a, a, a little booklet on this that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was uh, part of the uh, consultation team on, but you can sort of see uh, uh, this argument towards uh, body size. The pediatricians, uh, oh, this is one of the most strict things they do. Their, their fill volumes are determined by the size of the child, and they have uh, math to support that. And that was that, that middle uh, Durand uh, data that I showed you. Something to keep in mind when you think about um, uh, fill volumes, though, is this. So shown on the vertical axis is the relative uh, intra-abdominal pressure, and shown on the horizontal axis, then, is the amount of fluid you might put in the tummy. So when somebody is supine, which is what most of the cycler dialysis is, you can see that the pressures are the lowest, even with larger volumes. That's the red line. Pressure is the highest in somebody who is, in fact, sitting and straining to have a bowel movement. So that's the highest pressure. So these are things to keep in mind when you uh, think about fill volume. Now, what happens during fill volume? So here is fill volume and the intraarterial pressure. And I've shown in the middle here, uh, so the pressure goes up when the, when the fluid goes in. And depending on how much fluid goes in and the ultrafiltration that's occurring, you can see that the pressure does rise just slightly over the course of the uh, uh, dwell because of the ultrafiltration. But it's, it's, while it is rising, that's for sure, it is fairly small in the big picture of, uh, of things. So the UF does not raise the interabdominal uh, pressure all that much, a little bit, but, but not all that much. So what happens to transport status? Now shown here then is the peritoneal KT over V on the vertical axis and the fill volume on the horizontal axis. And there's two examples here. There's an example of a high transporter and there's an example of a low transporter, all right? And the point I, I wanna make here that each of the dots is about a 200 milliliter increase in the fill volume. So uh, it, the increase in the fill volume of less than 200 milliliters have a minimal impact on sensation of fullness, intraarterial pressure, and in fact, clearance, all right? So increasing at 200, you can get away with that. So the, the conclusion that one would draw from this is that if you want to increase the fill volume, do it slowly. And we'll usually do it by 100 milliliters per exchange per week. So here I've given an example, nudge it up by 200. But, but I, I can get that fill volume up from 2,000 to 2,500. I'll do it over the course of a month or two. What's the hurry? Just do it gradually. And most patients will actually tolerate that quite well. And the cyclers are perfect for that. It's just a simple uh, adjustment in the cycler. Oh, patients don't like that. Nonsense, nonsense. Here's a blinded study done out of Pittsburgh, the Beth Perino's program. And so the, the, the uh, green is uh, smaller people and the yellow is larger people. And, I, I, and this is awareness of the fill volume. And if you look at this, the people who are aware of their fill volume are the large people aware of the smaller volume. How's that for a twist, okay? But that's what these results show, all right? So caveats, lung disease, okay? Abdominal wall issues, small hernia, you don't wanna make it bigger. Uh, remember, ultrafiltration will occur, 100 to 300 milliliters, and so keep in mind what that does to pressure. All dextrose combinations are possible because the cycler, as you know, mixes the solutions after the heater bag, they're all mixed. And remember that even a three hour exchange of, of a 1.5, do you guys use the 1.37? Is that how you refer to the 1.5? Okay. So you do some things the way the US does and some things the way Europe does. Why you can't, you sort of, are you just in between? In between. All right. All right. Uh, so shown here is a cartoon of all transport types just to give you a, a little bit uh, of a perception for the degree of ultrafiltration, turquoise being a 7.5, pardon, 7 point, a 4.25. The yellow is an icodextrin. 
the uh, purple is uh, 2.5 and the red is a 1.5. So you get a little flavor for ultrafiltration. And then I've shown a little bit lower down the duration of some of the uh, 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 exchanges. So the cycler exchanges are much shorter and the CAPD long dwells are, uh, might be shorter and most likely are shorter than the long dwell of a cycler patient, of an APD patient. You could increase the duration of cycler time. Uh, there's usually a two-letter answer to the question, will you increase time on the cycler? Can anybody think of what that answer is? It's got two letters. Starts with an N. All right, no. <laughs> we'll move on, all right? So increase the number of cycler exchanges. That, you, you could do that. What are the implications of that? So here are shown that a patient uh, nine hours, eight hours, and seven hours, and I only want you to zone in on the seven hours. Uh, that may not be average, but it was easier to do the math, so stick with me. So look at the green line at seven hours. And if you look at the vertical axis, it, it's dwell time, all right? So uh, let's do seven exchanges in seven hours, uh, and I'll show you where that circles out, out to be. So you're, you should say seven cycles over seven hours, a dwell time of 35 minutes, what's, what's going on? Well, what's going on is the downtime. So uh, this is why an exchange every two to three hours uh, may be more time efficient than an exchange every hour. I just said seven exchanges, seven hours, there's a lot of downtime. Because there's obligate uh, uh, lost time during filling and there's obligate lost time during drainage. And remember what you're trying to do is have surface area contact peritoneal membrane to uh, dialysate. And so you want that fluid in there and during drain and fill you're kind of inefficient. So what I've shown at the bottom is a cartoon of an hourly exchange with the, uh, the fill time is green and the drain time is yellow and the the actual transport time is red, and you can see that that's 35 minutes. So that one exchange every hour, seven exchanges over seven hours on the cycler uh, is what I showed you a moment ago, and, and that's very inefficient. Why is that? Let's look at it another way. So it, the kind of brownish area is the effective therapy. And you can see in that blue area uh, with the green arrow that uh, that's marginal therapy because you're draining. And then you can see that there's a period of time after that, that where there's, there's absolutely no therapy at all when the patient is empty. So this is if the, the brown area, the tannish brown area is the effective time. And so you wanna fill this time or fill this belly. That's the whole idea. And so uh, it's called the uh, transition point of the drain. And so slowing down the cycles is what this is all about and uh, how that might be advantageous for uh, clearance. The, the next step in the priority of options is adding a daytime exchange. And I'm gonna show you two examples of that. Uh, uh, so here's the uh, impact of a day exchange. Uh, yes or no is what these are. And this is a high average transporter. As you know, 75% of our patients are either gonna be high average or low average. So, so the, the vertical axis is the peritoneal KT over V and the uh, uh, horizontal axis is the total amount of fluid used during the day. So a daytime exchange, as you can see, it does improve the KT over V regardless of whether uh, you're a uh, high transporter or otherwise. Uh, but, but look at the difference between the, uh, the, the, the advantage of a daytime exchange versus not. So the, the daytime exchange is a, is a significant value difference in KT over V if you were targeting KT over Vs. So let's look at a low average. So a low average patient and the difference between them is even more. And so the conclusion of the advantage of a daytime exchange is mostly, is really important the lower the transport status. The higher the transport status, uh, they're, they're moving solute better at night on the cycler, whereas a low transporter is, really does need those day exchanges uh, to get rid of that solute. So uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, Salim Majayas did an analysis of uh, cyclers sort of exploded about this time in the U.S. And so these are uh, an analyses of what happened in the U.S. And remember, our patients are about 80 kilos on the average. Uh, so we increased fill volumes from 2,000 to 2,500. 
we actually decrease the number of cycles for the arguments that I've just made from five to four, and we increase time on the cycler. Now, just so you know, my bias is to get them to increase time on the cycler, but you also heard the answer for the majority of my patients. So these were the priorities uh, that I talked about uh, with cycler dialysis, which in your hands is, uh, represents 80% of your patients. So I want to conclude with, in 2016, we want to do everything we can to preserve residual kidney function. Uh, that, that's another topic altogether. Uh, but a, a trial of increased dialysis is, is desirable for any patient who is unwell and you don't know why. Those are the people we increase dialysis on. In cycler patients, a dry day can, can and should be used only if there's residual kidney function. And in here, I, I've said five milliliters per minute. I don't think it has to be quite that rigid. Uh, if you must report the KT over V, uh, then I think you should uh, try to have uh, at least 1.7. So I would argue that 1.7 is the, is the lower limit, not a target. That's why in DOKI we said target two, because we wanted to achieve a 1.7. And our attitude was towards targeting rather than minimal values. That was our problem. That was our mistake with DOKI.